All right. Um, so I would like to welcome everyone to today's program. Uh, I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Jaleesa Johnston and I'm head of public programs and engagement at the Portland Art Museum. Um, and I'll begin with my verbal description, uh, which is an important accessibility tool that is useful for audience members who cannot see the screen. And for my verbal description, I would like to share that I am a black woman. Uh, I have black curly hair that today is pulled back in a bun. I'm wearing black rim glasses and a gray sweatshirt. And I'm sitting in my office space, which is um, a blue room. It has blue walls. And I have two very full, um, maybe even two full bookcases behind me. And again, I would like to welcome everyone to today's program, Frida, Fibromyalgia and Feminism with Dr. Ginevra Lipton and Vanessa Severo. Uh, this is the second program um, of a series of programs that we are having for Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera and Mexican Modernism, an exhibition that we currently have on view at the museum through June 5th. Uh, if you haven't been able to come out and see the exhibition and you are able to, we do encourage you. It is very beautiful very packed with amazing artwork um, and also very full. There are a lot of people in attendance, especially on weekends, which is great. Um, so next I'd like to share a land acknowledgement. The Portland Art Museum recognizes and honors the indigenous peoples of this region on whose ancestral lands the museum now stands. These include the Willamette Tumwater, Clackamas, Kathlamet, Molala, Multnoma, and Watlala Chinook peoples, and the Tualatin Kalapoya, who today are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron, and many other Native communities who made their homes along the Columbia River. We also want to recognize that Portland today is a community of many diverse Native peoples who continue to live and work here. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all Indigenous communities, past, present, future, and are grateful for their ongoing and vibrant presence. And next, I'd like to share some accessibility uh, details with you today. So we do have automated real time captions available for this program. Uh, if you are with us on zoom, you can access them by clicking the CC live transcript button at the bottom of the zoom window and choosing show captions. Once on you can click the caption box with your cursor and move it around the screen. Um, you may also choose show full transcript, which will show the captions in a column on the right side of the screen. This window can also be clicked on and moved. And if you're joining us on Facebook, captions can be turned on by clicking the settings gear icon on Facebook, uh, window live and choosing captions. These captions are great, but we recognize that they are not always accurate. Uh, we will be correcting the captions before the video of this program is posted on YouTube. And for any vocabulary that uh, the captions may miss during the program, today we do have some vocabulary words that we'll be dropping into the chat and sharing with you as well. Um, and if you would like to utilize uh, American Sign Language interpreters, please join us on Zoom as Facebook doesn't always show them. Uh, we would like to thank our interpreters today, Sarika, Metha, and Dana Walls for making this program accessible. And then if you have any questions or need any technical assistance regarding access, please notify us in the Q&A on Zoom and in the chat on Facebook. Um, and during today's program, um, if you are here with us on on Zoom uh, and you have any questions for our presenters today, please enter your questions into the Q&A box. If you're on Facebook, enter them in the chat and we have someone that will drop them in the Q&A box on Zoom for us uh, when we get to the audience Q&A at the end of the program. Um, and so the next, uh, also sponsors, I totally almost forgot this. We would like to thank our sponsors, really important, we can't forget that. Uh, thank you for the support in this, pro in this program and all the other programs as well as in the exhibition as a whole. And now um, I would like to uh, welcome on my colleague, Becky Emmert, who is head of accessibility at the Portland Art Museum to share with you um, an opportunity to continue discussion after this program.
Hello, everyone. Welcome to our program today. We are so excited to be able to partner with the Curi Curiosity Paradox, which is Grant Miller and Jonathan Paradox Lee. And in this partnership, we are going to be able to offer an opportunity for you to join in conversation and community with others after this program. And that's going to happen on Discord. And if you're unfamiliar with Discord, you can check um, the chat and I've put in the link um, to the Discord server and the thread that we will be using today, and then also information about uh, how to use it if that is new technology for you. The Curiosity Paradox are artists who are queer, non-binary, disabled people with white settler ancestry. They are organizers of the current iteration of disability representation or DISREP, producers of the Desire Path Project, and co-creators of Threshold Practice, an assistive technology for theater, meetings, and any other time that two or more human or non-human people spend time with each other. Please check the chat uh, for links on their website. And um, if you're interested, check their uh, website for, um, they have an opportunity where you can sign up and they will send out uh, emails, not too frequently, no more than once a month um, to share about upcoming projects and information and ways that we can connect together. The discussion will continue during disability representation sessions this year, which are starting April 10th and continue through May 22nd. And uh, the goal of that is um, they've shared, we want to expand our understanding of what access means and think about how we can create spaces and a world where all kinds of accessibility are centered and valued. So please definitely check that out and learn more about that. And then the other part of the website that we would like you to check out is the Desire Path Project. And I had the pleasure and honor of partnering with them along with other disabled and non-disabled leaders in Portland who are considered access artists. Access art describes the ways that marginalized people and communities creatively grow resources, design accessibility, celebrate joy, and resistance and outmaneuver supremacy culture and dream worlds beyond the impossible, which I think ties in so nicely with the content that we're going to be talking about today. So now I'll turn it back over to Jalisa to introduce our speakers. Awesome, thank you, Becky. Um, it's really exciting that we get to partner with Curiosity Paradox uh, for the conversation around this program. Um, and then also just a heads up that we have more programs coming. So please keep an eye on the events calendar for the museum for future programs. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And I can finally get to um, the, the program of today. So it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce the speakers of today's program. Frida, Fibromyalgia and Feminism, a program that looks at the impact Frida Kahlo's disabilities had on her art, how her art impacted her experiences as a disabled individual, and how she changed cultural norms around disability and chronic illness. This program is a collaborative discussion between Dr. Ginevra Lipton and Vanessa Severo. Dr. Ginevra Lipton, MD, is a graduate of Tufts University School of Medicine. After developing fibromyalgia in medical school, she became fascinated with Frida Kahlo after reading a medical journal that Frida lived, likely experienced the same illness. After completing a residency in internal medicine, Dr. Lipton founded the Frida Center for Fibromyalgia, where she specializes in treating this painful and complex illness. And we are also joined by Vanessa Severo. Vanessa Severo is the recipient of the TCG 11th round of the Fox Foundation Resident Actor Fellowships 2017. She is the playwright and actor of Frida, a Self-Portrait 2020 Kilroy's List, a one-woman one production about the tumultuous and brilliant life of Frida Kahlo. Vanessa is passionate about utilizing the element of Suzuki method in her work to challenge the boundaries of storytelling and explore the depths of movement, composition, and the power of stillness. And with that, I pass it over to Dr. Lipton and Vanessa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So I'm Ginevra Lipton, and my verbal description is I'm a white middle-aged woman with shoulder-length brown hair, 
purple glasses and I'm sitting behind in front of a wood background um, and I'm in my office at the Frida Center for Fibromyalgia, which seems appropriate. Um, I'm so excited to be joined by Vanessa because when I saw her play, I literally, this is her as Frida, I literally was uh, I developed a new crush beyond Frida Kahlo. Now I have Vanessa as Frida Kahlo <laughs> as my new crush. Uh, it, it was, I was laughing, weeping. I mean, I literally like, it took me like five minutes to pull myself together after. <laughs> I had to let everybody else go because I was like weeping so much. It was really wonderful. I'm gonna start crying again. Um, <laughs> so, so with that, that's my introduction and verbal description. Vanessa, would you like to... Tell us about you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, that was wonderful. Uh, I am Vanessa Severo. I am a Brazilian woman with with a little bit past my shoulders black hair. I've got very intense, severe looking eyes. And <laughs> behind me is a bookshelf of a lot of books that came from an antique shop, which I have not read. Um, to piggyback on what Dr. Lipton said, um, a long time ago, which uh, has probably been about seven years now, I had a really good friend that was having coffee with me and he said, Vanessa, I see a Frida Kahlo in you. And I thought it was a really bizarre thing to be told. And I, to this day, don't really know what he meant. So I started to research Frida Kahlo. And then in researching her, I was fascinated to find this woman that had so many mirrored circumstances as mine in my in my my life today as somebody who was living in the 40s and like dr lipton i i felt like this person was communicating with me like here's a i'm a latin woman i have a disability and here's frida kahlo this hispanic woman with disabilities and how she overcame everything with through art and and she was in such debilitating pain that i was fascinated that this woman I didn't want her to be forgotten so I thought well what if what if Frida is talking to us today because if you read any of her quotes she's extremely tweetable and <laughs> uh so so I, I just started writing the play and the first version just focused on six of her tragedies and then it expanded and um and it was the show that I ended up bringing to Portland Center Stage in which my new girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> well, I also found Frida, I found Frida at a very dark time in my life when I developed fibromyalgia in medical school, uh, which is a condition of chronic uh, widespread pain, fatigue, and brain fog. Uh, at that point, I didn't, I saw many doctors, specialists, nobody could really um, give me any answers. And they basically just said, you know, you have to learn to live with this. And I felt devastated. I mean, I was 26 and I felt like my life was over. And uh, I remember uh, finding a medical journal uh, where some rheumatologists, some Mexican rheumatologists looked back at Frida's uh, diaries and at her uh, paintings and, she described so many of those symptoms of widespread pain, of fatigue. Um, and we certainly know she was dealing with really severe chronic spinal generated pain. So these rheumatologists kind of said, you know, I think she would probably have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia were she alive today. And all of a sudden it was like a light bulb went off because I was looking at this woman who was incredibly successful as an artist, I mean, not, not so much during her lifetime, she had some success, but posthumously she has blown up. I mean, she is amazing, amazingly successful. Um, and so it gave me so much hope that she could live such a bold and beautiful life and do, do great things even with chronic pain. So that's really why I named my clinic for her. And that's kind of how I, how I came to fall in love with Frida or be a Frida file. I guess you're also probably Vanessa, a bit of a Frida file. <laughs> so I think we come to this uh, this lecture with a lot of love for Frida, but also some curiosity. And I think um, I think we can hopefully share with you some things that maybe you didn't 
know about Frida and uh, what her life was like um, and how that, how her chronic pain and her disabilities affected and actually influenced and created the artist that she, she was. So, so with that, do you want to, do you want to start with the slides? Yes. All right. We put together a slideshow for you all. All right. Let me make sure I'm doing it correctly. Here we are. All right. So Frida Kahlo, a personal portrait of pain. We liked that alliteration a lot. Um, and here's Frida, just a few phases of her life. We've decided to kind of focus on every time Frida um, encountered something that caused pain in her life and how she overcame it. So um, Frida Kahlo was born actually on July 6, 1907. And this is Casa Azul, where she was born, lived most of her life, and actually died in this house. Uh, when I received a grant to study Frida Kahlo, I went through this house. I wanted to be immersed in the world that she lived in. I wanted to smell the streets and all of it. <laughs> but the, the funny thing about Frida Kahlo, beginning at the very beginning, is that um, this is her actual birth date, July 6, 1907. But she told people later on that she was born on July 7th, 1910. And not to make herself younger, but in fact, she wanted to mirror and reflect the Mexican Revolution. So she started telling people that as to say that she was born the same time that the Mexican Revolution happened. So she already comes in um, fireworks ablazing. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to piggyback on anything with that? Or do you want to? No, I think we can. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So Frida contracted polio when she was six years old. This is her at six years old. And she started by telling that she felt immense pain in her right leg. And that's what she confronted her parents about. Um, I do know from from readings that I've done as much research as I could have done on it is that her parents, um, she her mother, Matilde, and her father, Guillermo, um, they had very different views on her polio. Her mother was, it was a very um, strict household. She wanted Frida Kahlo to lay down a lot. She didn't want her to be in pain. Her father kind of was on the other side of the spectrum of that and really pushed Frida to move through the pain of polio. He had her do these rigorous exercises, which I'm not too sure what they are in my play. I, I do Suzuki method to try to emulate that. But he also would make her ride a bicycle, which was extremely painful for her, but ended up working because instead of her being bedridden, like a lot of the kids her age were with polio, she ended up walking, but did maintain a limp for the rest of her life because of the polio. One leg just never grew as long as the other. And she also wanted to disguise it by putting on many socks on one leg so that they looked even. And I think what's amazing about how her father kind of, I mean, you have to think this was, you know, what, still in the 19 teens. Mm -hmm. um, he encouraged her actually to go play with the boys, like go play soccer, go play in the street to kind of help her be strong. So already at, at six or seven, she's she's kind of um, being kind of rebellious and and being a feminist, you know? And I thought that was so amazing. I just have this picture of her kind of running around in the streets um, with her one leg that's a little bit shorter and a little bit skinnier actually too with polio gets some muscle wasting. And I think she really did a lot of uh, disguising of that with socks and then in her later years with the long dresses and the long skirts and even pants, I think. Um, but she don't, I mean, polio hurts. Post polio syndrome is is really painful and she had she had pain in that leg her whole life, basically, after, after that. And that was sort of her first introduction to, to suffering pain, physical pain, I think, at a very young age. I'll also like to point out that she had two older sisters and one younger sister, but Frida was photographed more than any of her other siblings. Her father was very much into photography and found that Frida was a good subject. So he taught her very much how to pose even at the age of six, as you can see, which you will see lends itself to how she paints herself later on in her life. Indeed. <laughs> so here's her family. Yes, she had. She actually had uh, four full older brothers and two and a half 
two half siblings, and then of course her sisters that were her her blood relatives. And this isn't a, this is a picture that's in the gallery right now, but. The one I wanted to put up and I didn't, um, I don't think I have it here. It, it has Frida with the family uh, dressed and everyone, it's the family portrait, which everyone, you know, made a great big deal of, you know, and it took, it took hours to get ready for and it took an hour sitting in front of the camera. But in the, this photo is Frida at age 18 and she is dressed in a full on suit from her father. And so she is already doing this gender bending and dressing as yes. a man for yes. the family photo um, for all time and prosperity. And she's very, very handsome in it. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, Dr. Lipton. So Frida had this horrible accident in a bus that collided with a streetcar in 1925. She was going to school um, and with her boyfriend, Alejandro, and she was 19 and and was going to school for uh, becoming a, a medical illustrator. She was very much into medicine at the time and buses were new at the time in Mexico City and they didn't have, there were no laws. At this point in time, Dr. Lipton and I were talking about how there just was no regulations. Like there's, yeah, there's just horses. chaos. There's chaos. Like there's the no rule of like stop and go. So you've got a streetcar, which has is been going. You've got people still in horse carriages. You've got people on horses and then you've got the bus. And the bus was like the new thing. They were like, oh, the bus, you know? So she gets on a bus and then they got off of the bus because she had, it, she forgot her umbrella. And she gets on another bus with her boyfriend and the bus collided with a streetcar, sending the bus and the streetcar going almost a mile down the road. The result is a lot of things happened, but uh, a rail from the streetcar went through the bus and went through Frida Kahlo's abdomen and uterus and out the back of her. Um, so, and Dr. Lipton will talk about what that resulted in. A lot of bizarre things happened. People talk about how she was probably the most injured of the passengers. That's up for debate, but that's the story we have. And also in a weird, in a weird, series of events, all of her clothes got ripped off and she was bloody, but there was also an artist on the bus who was carrying a container of gold powder. And so when there was the collision, the gold powder came up and landed all over her. And so when every when everything had stopped, a worker, a male construction worker had noticed she had been impaled by this rail and pulled it out of her body. And the stories recall that when they lifted her up in the air, it was just this fascinating sight to see this nude woman covered in gold and red because she was bloody. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Lipton now because because she knows about all the things that happened with that. Well, I mean, I, I had never known about the gold dust part mm -hmm. till I saw your play and and this image of her sort of like you can just picture like everything going up in the air and then like as it settles this gold dust settles on her naked body which is you know somehow under the bus and impaled and her boyfriend is totally unharmed um but she is uh it's almost angelic you know it's like this this image of her with this gold dust and it's certainly very artistic if it's not if it's not true i certainly like it i i it's an image i like to hold on to um, but she was so severely injured, um, it punctured many of her internal organs um, and broke, fractured her pelvis in many places, her lower spine. Um, and they didn't think she was going to survive. You know, they, he, the worker pulled out the impaled pole, they brought her to the hospital, and uh, it, it was considered pretty miraculous that she survived. And I think she was in the hospital for like two months or something like that, um, pretty much uh, bed bound and then uh, sent home. And she was bed bound still for a bit, a bit longer. And she talks in her letters and journals about how bored she was. And um, I think that's when she started to get a little bit more serious about doing some, doing some art, like starting to do some sketching. Um, and I think this picture is from maybe later. Or this is later. Yeah. Um, um, 
But I, I, what happened too also to piggyback on that is that she was into medical drawings at the time, but out of her boredom, she asked to put a mirror above her bed so she could see herself. And then spending, she spent over a year in, in her bed looking at this mirror that she decided to start painting herself. She said, I painted the subject I knew best myself. So she started doing these self portraits, starting with this accident, which is where everything shifted for Frida Kahlo. And at beginning, she didn't think they were any good. And ones that she did feel were good, she would send to her boyfriend, whom she would say, don't visit me. I don't want you to see me like this, but I want you to see me like this. Right. And unfortunately, the relationship ended because of the separation. But it is the beginnings of Frida finding a way to express her pain and her loneliness and to do it unapologetically. Yep. Yeah. And then I believe she, uh, she meets Diego, the next, what does she call it? Two great tragedies of her life. One was the bus accident. One was Diego. <laughs> she says, I, I, um, I have suffered two accidents in my life. One was the trolley and the other was Diego. Diego was by far the worst. So we've put this in here because this is a huge shaping shift for Frida Kahlo. Did it cause pain? Absolutely. It's emotional pain. Um, they were, there was about a 20 year difference in their age. He was this huge towering man, about six foot three, six foot four. He was just enormous. And she loved the enormity of him. She said that she, his stomach looked like a tight, like he was hiding a shiny, smooth present in his stomach. I mean, she was just into him. She was, and she said she loved his female feminine breasts he had these you know yes. breasts like she was she into the to bathe him yeah. i mean there is someone for everyone so <laughs> you know frida frida met him supposedly met him while he was painting a mural by her school when she was 12 and she watched him for a long time and then told her best friend in the schoolyard i'm going to marry that man someday and so by the time she was up and walking and out of bed she went to where he was working on um, near a cathedral and um, and painting, and she approached him with her artwork, her, mm -hmm. her self portraits. So and brave, asked, yeah, brave. and asked him right away if if uh, he, she could make money doing that. And his recall of it is that when she approached him, it was this woman with with intense eyes and eyebrows that looked like there was a crow on her face. And so he, they, there was this attraction immediately. But within a year of this meeting, they married and their parents called it the marriage between a dove and an elephant. <laughs> She, I didn't realize how um, petite she was. I, you know, in my mind's eye, I had thought she has such a, such a big energy. Somehow I had thought she was like, you know, 5'10". I know, she was right? only like 5'1", 5'2", 120 Tiny. pounds. Yeah. So in comparison with him, su such a different, yes. um, but she also, I mean, she loved him as an artist and he really encouraged and supported her art in a way that um was was very impressive and very loving like I she wouldn't she wouldn't have become the artist that she was without him I think you know his encouragement his support his right. promotion of her and it's interesting too um that in in not only her artistry but as herself she became this work of art after meeting Diego he really encouraged her her mother was um from Spanish and indigenous descent. So he really wanted her to get back to her roots. And so you start to see that once Frida is with Diego, her style changes mm -hmm. and she starts putting these flowers in her hair. She's kind of making a crown for herself. Mm -hmm. And then she starts dressing herself in uh, traditional Mexican clothing yep. called um, a hoopy and, and these skirts that were layered and layered, which did two things, they disguised her polio and and her legs and the unevenness of her walking, but also disguised um, the loose shirts disguised when she had to be corseted in in right. a plaster cast. So right. she was able to disguise what she was doing, but also kind of be this colorful, unique human that you didn't see anyone else in Mexico City at the time dressing the way that she no, did. No. And I love, they talk about when she and Diego visited um, San Francisco, when she walked down the street, it was like an event, like people were just like stunned. They'd never seen anyone like her um, with her dress and her, you know, the way that she adorned herself. And I have been thinking, 
I've been thinking what, what would Frida be like if she was alive today? These are the things I think about, you know, when I'm spacing out in the shower or something. And I think, I think she would be a, a huge social media influencer. And I think she would be somebody like Lady Gaga, who like <laughs> uses her, right? Like wearing yeah. a dress and 100%. The, right. And presents. Yes. And, and Lady Gaga has fibromyalgia. So yeah, right. she does. I'm just thinking that there's I, somehow, somehow I feel that the way that Frida was able to craft her, her image and the way she did it, she, she, she crafted the way she wanted to be seen. Mm-hmm. And that is something that uh, these days is very common, right? Everybody sort of Instagrams themselves and uses the filters to, but I'm not sure back in the thirties and forties that there was so much she had this emphasis and like this natural way of just, I don't know, adorning her. She became a work of art, like right. her body, her, her dress. And I love that about her. I just, I love that she did that. Same here. All elements of her um, were authentic. I just have some photos of her and Diego here. Um, and just how much they, they both ended up joining the Communist Party after they got married, too, as well. So they felt like they were trailblazers. And this is clearly them going to America, which she traveled with him a lot of times everywhere. Um, and you can find articles of Diego working, um, <laughs> working at, in San Francisco. He's painting this huge mural. And then this, this news person, this a newsman came to interview them and goes on and on about Diego. You can find this on the interwebs. But then there's a little tiny picture of Frida in the corner painting and it says, and the little lady likes to dabble in a bit of artwork herself, you know. <laughs> um but yeah, she also said when she got to America they, she was questioned a lot about her her unibrow and she said, I will not restrict my expression to fit your idea of what a woman should look like. Yes. Bam. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's what we're calling. (laughs) Love it. Yeah. uh, Moving on. What is this year? I can't even read it now. There's a square on top of it. It's 1930 something. Maybe it's 1930. I do. 1930. It's 1930. 1930. Yes. In San Francisco. So this, I'll talk about this painting and then you, you can talk about like what, what happened. Yeah, this is uh, called what the water saw or what the water gave me. And she painted around this time, um, you know, she was having a lot of trouble with her her circulation in her feet. I know that. And so it's something that's an interesting painting because it's not so much a self portrait of more of just like what's happening around her. Mm -hmm. And she's got a lot of things of like talking about life and death and cycles. She has her parents in the photo. And it's I feel like it's interesting because it's her right foot that she was having all the problems with and she's painted it where there's a cut in it and she's viewing it but she's also showing kind of like a cyclical thing happening in her life a rebirth that change does happen that we evolve and we move on from things so i'll I'll hand it over to you yes so she struggled because of the post polio syndrome uh, in that right right leg she always had poor circulation and she would develop these ulcers that wouldn't wouldn't heal. And so um, I think this is the first time in 1930 where she was treated by some surgeons in San Francisco uh, to try to help heal up these, these ulcers. Um, and one of the doctors that treated her became like a lifelong friend. I mean, she sort of became friends with everybody she met, it seemed like. She sort of gathered friends as she went along, but she she would write letters back and forth with this doctor her whole life and ask him uh, opinions, you know, later in her life when she needed to have um, amputations of toes and then later her uh, lower leg, uh, she wanted his opinion. Um, and so she starts to kind of develop this uh, real interest actually in, in medical things through her own body. I mean, she had that interest in becoming a medical illustrator, even a medical doctor she had wanted to be at one point. And then through her own body, she really starts to like learn uh, so much. And and then she kind of, she always wants to get, she always is requesting like um, medical drawing books. You know, she wants to learn the actual, the correct anatomy. And I just think it's so, so fascinating. Um, So this was the first time she's really treated for the 
um, ulcers, but they plagued her her whole life. I mean, she was constantly having recurring ulcers and infections. And then ultimately, I think in like 1944, 1946, uh, she lost several toes to gangrene. She woke up one morning and three toes were black and mm -hmm. ready to fall off. And um, that was a continual, her right foot was a continual battle for her. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So here it is in 1932, two years later, and she was in Detroit. Now, Frida Kahlo suffered, as we know so far, four miscarriages. Um, and at the time, she wasn't sure what was going on. She thought that, as you can see in this portrait, she's had a miscarriage, but as you can see, her fertility, she thought was slow. Therefore, there's a snail attached to her. She's got the, you know, a fetus of a young child. She's got her uterus in there. She's got a flower, a jacaranda flower that's on the ground, which is popular in Mexico and her pelvis. And then there's like a sort of um, medical machine. I'm, I've never been too sure as to what that was. But the reason for the miscarriage is because after the accident, the bus accident, what had happened is when that rail from the trolley went through her uterus and she healed up, it never, she healed to where the uterus had tightened up. So there's scar tissue in there. And every time she was pregnant, she would get towards the second trimester and, and it couldn't expand to hold the child, therefore she'd miscarry. But she put a lot of guilt on herself about it. She said she wanted a little Diego, and she continued to try for, for quite some time. Um, but this is the first and only time I do believe that she has depicted it in such a, a way that is a conversation still today, because it is something that people today, I feel, don't talk about. Oh, this is still, this is when, Frida, I think, really starts to show how bravely she will present the the suffering that she is experiencing, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional. I mean, this is such a um, like even today, I could imagine people feeling like wanting to turn away from this because it's so uncomfortable to see. Mm -hmm. And miscarriages are still kind of uh, there's stigma there's this shame around it people don't want to talk about it so here she is just kind of putting it out there which she continues to do later i mean so much throughout her life but this is when it seems to like shift where she's like here you're going to see you're going to look at the suffering because i'm showing you mm -hmm. and it also kind of shows the medical accuracy so she when she was in the hospital um for this miscarriage she actually requested from the doctors, she wanted an anatomy book. She wanted to be able to draw a fetus correctly. And they refused because they said, oh, it will just upset you further. And she became frantic. She really needed this. And uh, after a few days, Diego actually got one for her. And that's when he said she stopped crying because she could focus on this. And she, what she focused on was practicing and learning how to draw draw a pelvis accurately and draw, you know, the fetus accurately. So her kind of medical illustration background show or interests kind of show up here too, which is fascinating to me. Thank you. Um, here's just another drawing at the same time, as you can see. And this is an exhibit in Portland. If you, mm -hmm. these drawing, these uh, lithographs are there. Which is great. I hadn't seen this one until this exhibit, um, but here it is, just like Dr. Lipton was saying, like she has the correct anatomy, um, you know, and she's she's finding a way to channel her pain. Mm -hmm. So as a result, because at some point she realized that conception wasn't, and was told by doctors, like it's not a good idea, she started um, taking on uh, animals quite a bit. She had monkeys. She had um, little hairless dogs, little zitolitos, which are the most hideous dogs I've ever seen in my life. And weird looking. Them. They yeah. have no hair and they have one tooth usually, so their tongue is continuously hanging out of their mouth. She also started collecting birds and she collected peacocks a lot. So once you go to visit Frida after, you know, she had returned to Mexico, she started to really mother in a different way um, with animals. Yes. And there's some great photos in the exhibit of her. Yeah, there's one with her. 
She had some birds, there were parrots. She had, a, there's one uh, photo of her with like a rabbit. Like she had a whole like <laughs> menagerie of animals. And I can only imagine like there must've been somebody whose job it was to like clean up all the poop yes. or I, I don't know. <laughs> There is one photo that I didn't find, but there's one with Diego holding that little dog and his expression says all of it. He's like, oh. <laughs> um, in 1934, she has her first sur surgery of many on her right foot, as Dr. Libden was talking about. She's getting her toes taken off and, yeah. and um, was definitely still fashioning herself in a way that would not attract attention to it. Right. Um, right. Made sure that she loved these red, she loved red shoes. She loved these red boots and she has different kinds. And if you go to her house, you can see in this one section of the house, they have her clothes. It's actually on an, an, an uh, exhibit of her clothes going around the US. I don't know since the pandemic, if it's still going, but um, you could see that she would get these shoes fashioned for herself and she would have a heel on the right one. And then the left one would be flat, but that way it would even up her her legs. But she would have, you know, stuffed toes in the front, so there would be a cushion. And so she still cared greatly about how she came across at that time. Uh, yeah. And she she at one point uh, for either this surgery or maybe the surgery and a later one, she would be in the hospital for prolonged periods of time. And so she would decorate her hospital room with all this art and then all her favorite communist leaders and then some of her own art. And um, apparently she would kind of be the hostess with the mostess and people would come like, you know, drink tequila with her and she would like regale people with stories or she apparently was a wonderful listener and wanted to she'd ask people to tell her about their childhood and she would listen for hours and so she was she was not just a great visual artist she was really a very fascinating storyteller and apparently she swore like a sailor and made up her own kind of words she used like um spanish words kind of differently and would she just had a, a very fascinating fascinating way about her I just and so not kind of ladylike you know what I mean like she just was so I just have the you know there's pictures of her like smoking her cigarette and drinking tequila and I was like I just would love to have hung out with her for an evening and heard her stories yeah she was known also in the hospital to be very flirtatious with uh the male nurses and doctors <laughs> as well um and uh and she liked to be the life of the party because she said she didn't want um, to be alone. So she always wanted to never come across that she was in pain when people came mm -hmm. to visit and she wanted mm -hmm. to be a good time for them, which is such a fascinating thing to me because in her paintings, you'd never know that, you know, like that's where she's letting it out. But yeah. she wanted people to stick around and, and hang out with her. True. And you, you'll notice in pictures of her in the early days, she really does a great job of masking the pain and she really smiles and you don't but I noticed in some of the later photos and particularly some in the exhibit, there were a few that really kind of, you could see the pain on her face. You could see the strain, you could see the fatigue. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that like kind of took my breath away a little bit because I was like, oh, like that's like, you can see the real suffering that she right. is experiencing. And she does so much work to mask it and like kind of, you know, she doesn't want, her physical appearance to be any different or you know to accentuate that she's suffering but then mm -hmm. you're, you're right you look at her art where it's like so obvious you know there's tears coming down there's you know blood leaking from her abdomen there's you know needles and the I think we get to that one next yeah um, you know nails on her yes I mean this this is a, a person in agony and, and there's so much leading up to this as well like something that i didn't put in here and we but it is it i think it's important to mention that her and you know she caught diego having an affair with her sister now they both had a very kind of open wild relationship she slept with men and women openly she was openly bisexual and um but when she caught diego in bed with her sister her younger sister christina she she divorced him and so in that time, I feel like the masking did come off to mm -hmm. an extent. 
Now, they were only divorced for one year and then they remarried. But within that year, she did an interesting thing where she she knew he liked her long hair. She knew he liked the flowers and the way she was dressing. Mm -hmm. She cut off her hair and put on men's suits for about a year just to be like, um, I know, I love that. Like, screw um, you. <laughs> so when they got back together, she did a fun mix and matching thing artistically where she would wear pants with one of her blouses, you know, and sometimes she has flowers in her hair, sometimes not. But I've noticed, Dr. Lipton, that after um, they got back together, that there isn't so much of that uh, facade or patina that she put on in photos. Right. She, she just right. herself yep. what she was feeling. <laughs> yeah, which I mean, Good for her, because it's exhausting to hold that in, you know? And I think her art starts to become even more and more bold and like showing both the physical representation of the suffering and pain she feels and also kind of the emotional piece. Mm -hmm. Like it, this is the broken column, one of probably my favorite of her works. Mm -hmm. And she represents herself in, that's actually a metal corset which accurately reflects, I mean, she was in, I think 36 corsets during her life to be immobilized. And this one was steel. So she had these steel bands that she lived in for months on end. And then it was uh, to try to allow her spine to, to heal correctly after she has a spinal fusion. And what's interesting to me from a fibromyalgia perspective is you know, fibromyalgia is really more widespread pain. And in this um, painting, she has those nails throughout her body all over, it's sort of showing the all over um, level of pain that she was experiencing. And interestingly, some of those nails are in the actual tender points that we use to diagnose fibromyalgia. So I feel like this painting is like the best visual representation of what fibromyalgia feels like between kind of the the obvious suffering and the the agony that she's in the tears and then kind of the barren wasteland behind her i mean this is just such a intense description of physical and emotional suffering um and it, it's just an astonishing astonishing art if you ask me i'm a little biased but i think it's i love great. this one um and you know, I put it in my play, <laughs> like I love it so much, but I also love that she challenges us to see ourselves in her with her point of view looking straight at us and telling us not to look away, mm -hmm. that this is what it is. Now, one thing that she did do in this, this painting and then she changed it, which I always kind of find interesting is that she did paint herself completely nude in it. And then later she says that she painted a hospital sheet over her lap to keep some mystery. So <laughs> good for you, Frida. Yes. Uh, but at the same time too, that she was using with this corset, she also had to do a chin strap under her mm -hmm. chin to elongate the spine, mm. sometimes eight hours a day. Yeah, so, and sometimes she would have to hang, like mm -hmm. she would hang from, you know, she'd be like supported here right. and then the rest of her would just be hanging for yeah. hours. I mean, what she went through was amazing. And up to this point, she's had almost 30 surgeries uh, in her life up to this point, yeah. which leads us to um, her 30th surgery, having her lower limb amputated um as dr lipton said that it had become gangrene um i won't go into the medical details of that i'll, I'll leave it to my doctor friend to tell. <laughs> one thing i will talk about what's happened here so this the best story i heard in mexico city about frida Kahlo and this amputated leg is that she had this boot fashioned to match her favorite shoes and of course there's a heel still on it and she did all of this to sort of disguise the disability and the fact that this leg has been removed and she went back to dressing in her skirts and her flowers on her head. But then she did this really fascinating thing. If you look on the shoe, if you look there, there's a little bell tied to it. So she <laughs> tied a bell to her shoe and they said that you would see Frida coming down the street and she just looks like this like goddess, this tower. And you'd be like, oh, it's Frida. And then you would hear ping. Ping, ping. <laughs> so everyone was like, well, what's that? So she's like calling attention to it, but also disguising at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes. And she, I mean, she bravely really, uh, she did not want, she fought really hard to have, uh, to find a way to not amputate the limb. 
and her, she, her doctors had been recommending it for several years prior to when she did it. And she only did it because it became truly infected and was going to, was going to kill her if it, if it didn't come off. Um, so she really didn't want to do it. And she afterwards became, after the surgery, became really deeply depressed. Um, and I think she, she rose to the occasion and, 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 you know, had this boot made and there's stories of her kind of dancing and saying like, look, I can, you know, move around again, but she still was in agonizing pain, like the right leg, the stump didn't heal correctly. So still was, it's really painful to have a, a non-healed stump that you're walking on and putting pressure on. So she, she was mostly using her wheelchair or sometimes some crutches at this time. Um, and became really depressed, understandably, the last year or so of her life. And um, she attempted suicide a few a few times and um, isn't painting very much. You know, it, she really, it's so sad when you read, read her last few years. And she, you depicted it very powerfully in your play, um, the, the morphine injections or the pain medicine injections that she was getting um, would sort of give her this euphoric burst and then she'd sort of crash and um, became very, there's kind of this tumult and she would get very angry and irritable and depressed and it was just agonizing. Yeah, at this point, it, it, a lot of people recall that she was self-medicating a lot. So she was, because she was in so much pain at this point that she was drinking copious amounts of tequila and then she was injecting herself with lots of medication, which was not, um, uh, not scaled out to what I think it should have been. So there's, yeah. there's always a lot of um, debate as to when she died, if it was an accidental suicide, if it was on purpose or if it was um, pneumonia, right? Or right. pulmonary disease. No, um, yeah, pneumonia and then pulmonary embolism is actually what's listed on the right. death certificate. So as you can see, like her leg was amputated and, and she became very depressed and a year later she died. But before she died, she was, she was bedridden, but had her first and only exhibit of her artwork in 1954 and she she wanted to attend and so in attendance they lifted up her bed and brought it to the art gallery and she was in the middle of the art gallery and her artwork was all around and they said in in that way she was almost part of the art itself and they said she was in good spirits telling people to get her shots of tequila and so as Frida you would expect went out with a bang um Yes, I love that she did that. <laughs> There's just because they, she really wanted to attend, and they were like, "You're not well enough." And she was like, "Well, take my bed there." And I'm like, "That." There's just something so beautiful about that. Like, you know, she she recognizes she she can't get out of bed, but she's not going to let it stop her. And that's, I think, the power. And I think that's that's where me and so many of my patients and other people I've spoken to with chronic pain that's what they respond to is her sort of strength and, and like, well, okay, I'm, I'm still going to do it my way. You know, like yeah. it might not be what society thinks it should be, might not be, I mean, has any artist ever attended their gallery opening in their bed? I don't think so. I think she was the first, she like, you know, she's probably the last. I mean, I don't know if anyone else has ever done that, <laughs> but she, she just forged her own path at a time where, I mean, at a time where even just being a female artist wasn't that common, but she, she did it her way and like with a bang, indeed. With a bang. bang so as we were saying, like she didn't, she didn't sell a lot of artwork um, while she was living, but uh, we wanted to end on this note, which maybe you all have seen in the news just recently. It happened in November, but it, um, at Sotheby's, uh, you know, they had the auction and this is uh, Diego on my mind and it sold for $34.9 million uh, just this last November. And um, Dr. Lipton and I were talking about how our emails were exploding at the time. <laughs> yes, yes. And I love that it's more than Diego's art ever. I mean, Diego's fine. He's, a, you know, I understand he's important and, and 
and Mexican and, you know, mural art. Um, but I'm a little biased in that I love that she, you know, sort of like the little lady who paints on the side, you know, it's like, no, no, I'm the big art star. Right. Like I, I just sold a painting for $35 million. Thank you very much. So uh, she came out on top, that's for sure. And there's a thing that she said when she first met Diego, and I think it stays true today. And it's the things that stay with us this way. When she met Diego and he said, uh, yeah, you have talent. That's what he said when he, she first showed her, her portraits to him. He said, you have talent. It was kind of a throwaway. And she said, I paint from my heart, senor, but you paint from your head. And I think that is just why we still resonate with her work today and why when we think about Mexican art or we think about art like Frida is the one that comes first to mind and then Diego because mm -hmm. this is what stays yes and that's that you're right that's what hits you about art it's not not it something that happens in your head it is right. in your heart and I I will say that you also accomplished that in your play it, it, hit, you. it hit my heart and I know that, I encouraged a lot of my patients to go see your play. Actually, I was like, you have to go see this. It was amazing because it spoke so much to, to my heart. Well, thank and you for reaching out to me and yes. asking me to do this yes. and to well, Portland Art Museum for hosting this. Yes. Yes. And if you've not seen, you won't be able to come see, you're, you're not local, but you should maybe come to Portland and come see. The exhibit is amazing. And it was the first time I've ever seen any of her art in up in up close you know I've just seen photos of it and it is such a different experience yeah. the texture and the detail like each individual hair on the head was and I was like oh my god you just get such a different sense and the depth of color and I'm not an you know I'm not a art historian I, I don't know the right words but I will say the detail and depth was amazing truly truly amazing and they have some um, kind of costumes, you know, like um, clothing, like she used to wear the traditional Mexican clothing. And then uh, some photos, a lot of photos of her and, and then some things from Diego too. But I really encourage you to go see if you haven't yet, um, it's truly a magnificent exhibit. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you both. Um, is it okay now for some audience questions or? Sure. Cool, awesome. Um, so we have, uh, so just a reminder everyone, if you're on Zoom and you have a question for our presenters today, please enter into the Q&A. If you're on Facebook, just enter into the chat and we have someone that will submit them over um, into Zoom for us. Um, now we already have a few questions. Um, but I'm just going to be like a little bit selfish and start off with my own question that I really <laughs> <love to> ask. <laughs> um, which first, it's just a comment. One of the things that I love about your discussion is it was this really full look at um, Frida Kahlo and like living a life that is both um, dealing with pain and like, you know, chronic pain. Um, but also like looking at the resilience, but also looking at how vulnerable that is. It was just this like really nice realistic balance of seeing like humanity in, in someone. And the reason I lead with that is because my question is um, for you both, and it's kind of, uh, I'm still trying to get my words together, but I'm curious about how you in your own practices um, sort of challenge the romanticization and mythology that's built up around Frida and around her pain um, in your own work. I would really love, and I know you both do that, so I'd love to just hear you elaborate more on your practices and just how you keep it a very grounded sense of both strength and resilience, but also like really acknowledging that, you know, pain is pain and it, and it can be very difficult to, to, you know, move through the day or move through certain moments. Do you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, I, for me, like I said, the first time I wrote the play, it was just about Frida. And and, and that's great because, it, it, I mean, there's so much there. But the thing that felt false to me is that as I started to work and develop it more, 
I realized that the biggest missing element was that I had to say why she was tied to me. And so I couldn't tell Frida's story without telling my own story and talking about what my life is like with a disability and the pain that I've had to go through and the surgeries that my parents wanted me to go through. And so for me, being able to ground her in in truth, I had to tell my truth. And that's what made it an even playing field for me. And and also was the hardest challenge, you know, because she challenges us to be our authentic self. And so I had to be my authentic self. And then I found out that that was the thing that that tied me to her and made her a living, breathing woman today instead of just this uh, freedom mania that we can see on all the bags. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you said that so well, because <laughs> at some point, like I'm, I'm both glad that Frida is so popular and so in the zeitgeist, but I also feel like she's a bit, a bit sort of just turned into a, I don't know, a hashtag or something, you know, like just sort of turned into a mono brow image, like that you do lose in her popularity. We've lost some of the depth and the understanding of her reality. Um, And when, when I, talk to patients about her or why she kind of means so much to me it's actually because of the ugly parts of her life it's it's the parts where she is crying or she is heartbroken about Diego's betrayal or she's um having her fourth miscarriage you know I I think when when we actually like the best parts of her art I think are those that show that the rawness and and their chronic pain is really painful. It's not, you know, it's not just sort of, you know, we like to think of the kind of victory part of it, like the, you know, she she was ended up being really famous and popular and came came to her gallery showing in her bed, but she came to her gallery showing in her bed because she was in so much pain and couldn't get out of bed. And so trying to kind of hold on to both sides of those, that duality has been important for me. Um, and it's not, it's not always, life is not always pretty. And this is where I think Instagram and social media, it's created, you know, people show their best selves. They don't show the themselves crying after a miscarriage. You know, they show their like victory stories, I guess, so. Well put. Yeah, thank you. Um, And then actually a kind of follow-up question from someone in the audience, um, again, regarding like uh, still on the topic of thinking about pain and in the way that we think about her pain and and scholars in particular. Uh, This question is, many scholars and historians share the perspective that she was just attention seeking in a way that discredits her disabilities and pain. Do you have thoughts about why this is the narrative that is often shared? I think that's going through the male gaze of a scholar. And um, I, I, in my research that I've done on most of it, it's usually men depicting that image and not women, um, which is, I mean, women women have to go through pain once a month already. Like we <laughs> have to do it. But I think that that's, that's the common thread there is that, what I have found is it's through the male gaze. Yeah, I would totally agree. I also think that it's um, it's almost because it makes us, it, it's too uncomfortable to think about her actually being in that level of pain. It's almost like, well, somebody actually in that level of pain couldn't have produced art or couldn't have, there's this sort of disbelief. So she must have been doing it for attention. And it does fit very much into that hysterical woman narrative and um i think that i think that actually happened during her lifetime as well i mean i think there there was kind of a lot of like yes yes you know and uh we know you're crying in your picture but like they're there i there's just this very paternalistic and um judgmental piece um and that hits me really hard because fibromyalgia itself because it primarily affects women has been very stigmatized. I mean, there was so many doctors for many, many years, mostly male doctors that said it's not real, it's all in their heads. Um, And so 
I, I can like feel that like the rage kind of building in me. And I mean, who knows? Like maybe there were some aspects that she sort of exaggerated as she told her stories, but like, that's her right. You know what I mean? Like it's our own, it's our story to tell. It's her story. So I feel like it's so dismissive and infuriating that people are like, and that's, that's actually even, I mean, that's not, that's not like something like 20 years ago, people were saying about her. It's like still a common, mm -hmm. common narrative. And even in the biography I was reading of her, which was quite good, there was still that sort of, there's these mentions of like, well, you know, it was thought that she was just doing that to get Diego's attention because, you know, it wasn't, she was feeling lonely. And so she just wanted his sympathy or she wanted people's sympathy. That's why she did this. And I don't know, that doesn't sit right with me. Right. And who's to say none of us are her. Right. <laughs> exactly. Like it's her freaking story and it's her art, you know, like if she's yeah. depicting herself with tears, like she, she has tears. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just thinking, listening to you both and like reflecting back, I was, I was just thinking about like the kinds of, um, romanticization and like the mythology building and the fascination with her and the, you know, even like romanticizing the pain yet at the same time, uh, you know, in a lot of circles and communities, there's still like a discomfort with folks in the community that are disabled. And there's very little patience there with the people standing next to us, um, which is like really, um, I don't know, something that we need to reflect a little bit more on, you know. For sure. Well, I think having programs like this help, you know, we're looking at it. And one thing we didn't mention is, I love that she painted herself in her wheelchair. She painted herself in her wheelchair when she was painting. It was one of her last self-portraits, I believe, maybe her last self-portrait is her in her wheelchair. And she has like on her palette, instead of paint, it's actually her heart. It's like, she's literally painting from her heart. And I was like, I mean, cause we, we think of like the wheelchair as something to like, not, you know, we don't want to see it. Right. Or, or it makes people uncomfortable and they don't, they don't know how to, how to handle somebody who's in a wheelchair, like look away, not look. And, you know, um, and I think she just is like, here I am. I'm in my wheelchair, deal with it. I think there's some, there's a huge amount of value in that. Yes, mm -hmm. well said. Um, and actually on that note, uh, there's another audience question. Um, this person says, it seems to be a common theme of her hiding her disabilities, but she tends to enjoy standing out in other ways. What do you make of this? And why do you think she covers up her disability? I think um, we all have a disability and, uh, you know, whether it's external or internal or both. And I feel like we to be able to navigate society, we have to find coping mechanisms. Right. I know I grew up wanting to find pockets in everything that I had so I could make friends. And then when they saw my hand, it wouldn't be this like weird thing. So I think that it's the same vein as that, that she had coping mechanisms to be able to integrate into society and navigate that. But also that authentic part of herself was like, but this is who I am also. Yeah. Like tying a bell. That's her own quirky way of saying like, there's something different about me. Like you figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yes. I, I think we do have our coping strategies to kind of, cause at some point it can be uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable to feel different. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think when we're younger, it's even more uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like as she ages, you can kind of see her become more and more sort of open about like, she doesn't paint herself in her corset until what, 1944 or something. That's when the late thirties early where she's painting on the corset too. Right. Right. But it's like her other self portraits are like, you know, kind of more, neck and above like she wasn't really focused so much on that until later and then it's almost like later in life you become braver and able to kind of talk about the show the difference and i know for myself when i first developed fibromyalgia in medical school i felt so much shame about it i didn't want to tell anybody i didn't tell my friends my colleagues my teachers because i didn't want to be judged or treated differently um and then it's only kind of later in my career and my life where now I sort of have made a career of talking about my fibromyalgia and uh, trying to draw 
attention to it as an illness and um, I'm, I'm very fibromyalgia forward, I would say. So I think it's a bit also of, of waiting until you feel brave enough to talk about it. And with some disabilities, you don't have that luxury. You know, there are certain ones that you can't, you know, kind of hide and then show when you want to. Um, so I think, I think sometimes there's not that, um, it's just sometimes more obvious and out there, but she, it seems like as she matured, she was able to more, I don't know, feel more comfortable with showing, showing mm -hmm. her differences, I guess, and almost, almost kind of highlighting them. Right. And in, in that, that way we find our people, right? Once we finally do it that, we're like, and I wonder if she, if people came forward and was like, I'm suffering from this as well, you know, we don't know, but I would like to think that that experience does open it up to finding like-minded, yes. like- That's true. That's a good way to think about it. And uh, this next question is actually uh, more specific to one of the last works that you showed. Um, so the painting with the nails and the column for the spine. Mm -hmm. um, on the painting with the nails as a representation of fibromyalgia, I wonder how you understand the painting's balance of pointed pain, the nail, and the chronic generalized pain over the whole body. Is it both? I think it is both. And in that, there's actually a lot of spinal pain, too. I mean, if you think about like the broken column, so you can when I look at that, I see sort of the, the, the significant spinal pain that she was dealing with and also the rigidity that she kind of had to hold herself in and then some, sort of the restrictions of that corset. And then to me, the, the nails kind of all over her body are sort of trying to represent that it's that she's hurting all over her body, that it's not just kind of in the, in the spinal cord. Um, but it's, it's possible that those maybe were kind of more points that she actually identified. I mean, she spent a lot of time examining herself and looking at herself and maybe there were some more points specific, but to me, the nails and how widespread they are kind of represent the, the widespread nature of the pain that I think she was experiencing along with that really localized spinal pain, which is a whole different well, right. I mean, she had fibromyalgia plus, I mean, she had the post polio, the foot pain, mm -hmm. she had the spinal, I mean, she had 30 something, at least 30 spinal surgeries right. and several foot surgeries. So if you think about being operated on 30 times for your back and having to be in corsets for, I mean, she spent years of her life in corsets, um, that there's so much pain pain there. She has all the, all the pain. Thank you. Um, and this next question is actually a bit different from all of the other questions so far that's really trying to hone in on understanding like our assumptions around the pain. Um, but this question is more thinking about gender expression. So mm -hmm. this person asked, um, did Frida encounter biphobia or discrimination for her non-binary expression in Mexico, which historically has been more conservative slash Catholic? Uh, when I went to Mexico City, that's a good question too. Thank you for asking it. I, I noticed that um, there was still a sort of stigma amongst the men in Mexico City that I encountered when I would ask about Frida Kahlo and tell them that I'm, I'm here researching Casa Azul and Frida Kahlo. A lot of the men were like, oh, they were a little bit like, oh, Frida, <laughs> no, but women uh, kind of saw her as um, a saint or our lady of Guadalupe, like she was kind of on par with a saint. And the where I find that she felt more open about it was in Europe, as well as in America. I mean, she's known to have had an affair with Josephine Baker, Georgia O'Keeffe and her had a, a thing going on and that and she would openly go out with women and be on a date with them and be affectionate with them in a romantic way but i i know in mexico diego really really enjoyed that she also slept with women it, he's he was known for having an affair with a woman the woman would be there overnight and in the morning frida would be making breakfast for all of them and he would say to the woman you know frida is interested in women as well so he was really 
uh, open and accepting of that. But I just found personally in Mexico City that men already still had this sort of like slight disdain towards Frida when I was there. And Diego was not okay with her having affairs with men. Like not she had to hide that, mm -hmm. which is, you know, interesting. So yeah. I, I, I do think that she, she both was very bold, like in, in kind of dressing sometimes in, in men's clothing. Um, but I don't know if she maybe chose her times and places well to express that. Like, you know, in New York, I think she felt very comfortable doing that and yes had many many lovers um and in Europe but yeah I, I don't know if she I don't think she was so obvious about it in Mexico at least I think it was maybe more subtle it was more in the home yeah mm -hmm. and uh actually on the topic of uh Diego uh someone else had asked um from my understanding of the question uh like how supportive he was. So the question is, did Frida manage her pain without help and understanding from Diego? So it sounds like it's asking about his, what what sort of role did he play in the support and supporting her? As far as I can tell and what I've read, he was supportive, uh, very supportive. Um, the hardest time she had is actually when she was separated from him and she has many detailed letters about how she wishes they were together and he could just take care of her. So I do believe he was supportive, but they also had a lot of help. They had doctors coming in all the time to, to help assist with her, but a, a lot of times they would spend most of their time in the art studio together while she was you know, either in a wheelchair and they would just work together. But I do know that he was supportive. That's my understanding as well. And there's some sweet stories of him, um, particularly in her later years when she was dealing with so much pain she was often afraid to be alone when she went to sleep so he would like hold her and like almost like a child or an infant and tell her stories or or poems or sing to her until she fell asleep so i think there was he was very compassionate i think in his way but he also would disappear for a week and you know it wasn't consistent i guess um but I never got the impression that he disbelieved her pain. I think he believed it. And I think he tried really hard to support and find ways to help her and also to focus her. He recognized that she did better when she was focused on her art. So as much as possible, I think that's how he helped her. Like he could see her suffering. And in fact, her, the nurse that was with her her last year of her life would tell her when she was upset, when Diego was gone, she would tell her that, you know, Diego cries when he hears you cry. So sometimes he has to go away because it's too hard for him to see you hurting. So I think on some level, Frida did know that he he saw her and care, cared for her in his, everybody always says to say it, in his way, you know, like he, he didn't, wasn't perfect, clearly. Thank you. Um, and then I have another question from an audience member. Um, what are your reflections on the opinion that she also had spina, sorry, I might mispronounce Bifida. that. Bifida? I'm sorry. Bifida. Mm -hmm. Bifida. I've heard of that. Dr. Lipton, what do you, I've heard of that. I, I haven't, I know that it's an, an idea that's been presented. Yeah. I, I haven't heard that with her you know, so spina bifida is where there's sort of an incomplete development of the base of the spinal cord or the uh, vertebrae. Um, and there was some possibility. I think what happened is when she had her pelvis crushed and they were trying to kind of put her spine back together, uh, the report was it didn't quite fit back together right. So there was some, they thought maybe it had, there was a little bit of genetic malformation there and maybe that's part of why it didn't heal up. But that's as far as I know, because she didn't have any spinal issues prior. Prior, so yeah. I don't. I don't think that that's. I think that. I think she just got so crushed by you know a bus or a you know tro trolley bus mm -hmm. trolley. Yeah, yeah. Impaled. <laughs> you know, you can imagine that this would deform the vertebra a bit. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then. Let's see, we've got a few more questions. Um, let's see, how about this one? This is an interesting one. Um, do you know where 
the money for her art sales goes to and are there charities or programs in her name such as you know pain research or such what i think and i mean i don't i don't know where the money goes to exactly but i think this is an interesting question in thinking about capitalizing like capitalization on an, an economy around her depictions of herself and what that means for it's an interesting question. And as with much artwork, it ends up in some person's house that they can appreciate. <laughs> we all know Madonna has one. Um, and good for them. But yeah, like this one that was por purchased, you know, it, it's it's in someone's house, you know, that is right. it's a personal artifact. And then, so there's, you know, artwork in, in very wealthy people's homes. And then I just know of the ones that circulate through museums and go with exhibits. But I right. don't know of any, any i wish i wish there was here's what i wish dream world scenario there's a frida kahlo lady gaga institute for fibromyalgia and chronic pain research that is funded by sales of her art i don't know i'm just or lady gaga could just mm -hmm. donate some money that's that's my <laughs> but alas i do not think that there is anything of the sort yeah yeah um and then i really like this question it's sort of i think this is a nice way to maybe close um uh, this person asked what frida kahlo quote and or painting speaks to you the most mm. wow. that is good oh there's so many oh goodness well, gracious i'm gonna oh. pull this one up here so this is what you ended your play with. That's my so I don't mean to steal, I don't mean to steal your thunder, but I used to think I was the strangest person in the world, but then I thought there are so many people in the world. But then I thought there are so many people in their world. There must be someone out there who feels bizarre and flawed like uh, in the same ways I do. I would imagine her and imagine that she must be out there thinking of me too. Well, I hope that if you are out there and you read this and know, yes, it's true, I'm here and I'm just as strange as you. Thank you. And um, actually there's our questions, Vanessa, about your play, and if there's an opportunity to see it still. I hear you're going on the road, right? Going on the road. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be at uh, the Cincinnati Playhouse in Cincinnati in October, November, and I'll be in Pittsburgh in May and June of 2023. So I might come to LA. We're in negotiations. That would be so cool. But yeah. If you, um, I'm, I have a website and I'll put it on my website. Um, it's a uh, Vanessa Severo.com. If you get the chance, it's really amazing. Thank you, Dr. Lipton. I want to hug you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was like, don't cry. Well, it's fine. <laughs> Frida makes me cry. It's okay to cry though. <laughs> it's good. Frida taught us that it's okay to try cry, you know? Paint yourself crying. Um, and then just one last question, Vanessa, about your, your plays. Are they available online? Is there an online option? There is not because um, that has to do with copyright laws and with the Dramatist Guild, but you'll have to just come see it in person and then wait around afterwards so I can talk to you. <laughs> Um, and then for folks wondering about this program, we will be able to post this program online. Um, bear with us. We have quite a few backlogged videos that we're trying to get up on the YouTube. So it's a bit of a slower process, but we will have this program available online for a year. So you can return to it and share it with folks. Um, and it will be on the museum's YouTube channel. Um, I think, and I think on that note, we can close. I just really want to thank you both, Vanessa and Dr. Lipton, for sharing all of that information, sharing your work and practices, and really also opening a vulnerable space to, to really think deeply about these issues and to think about Frida Kahlo and to think about her disabilities and to also think about um, 
the self-determination that's there, the agency that's there. It, this was really a special moment, I think, uh, within the context of this exhibition to think about. And I really want to thank you both for leading us through that discussion. Thank, thank you for you. having us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, thank you to my colleague, Becky Emmert, also for being the catalyst for, for like wanting to do this program and for helping it come to fruition. And thank you to our interpreters and thank you to everybody who attended today. And we look forward to seeing you in the galleries. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.